Fine. So uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this online course on shared memory programming with OpenMP. Um, my name's Mark Paul, um, and I'm going to start off with a short overview of what we're going to cover over, over the next four weeks. Um, yeah, so that's me. I'm a senior researcher at EPCC. I have interest in um, a lot of things to do with parallelism and parallel programming models and high performance computing. Uh, and I also represent EPCC on the OpenMP ARB, which is the standards body which looks after the OpenMP specification. Okay, great. So uh, here's what we're going to cover. So um, today I'm going to talk about in general about shared memory concepts uh, and then move on to look at the fundamental um, parts of OpenMP and how, how those relate to the general concepts. Then next week we'll get into some actual OpenMP syntax, uh, talk about parallel regions, which are the fundamental concept in OpenMP, how those work, uh, and then also talk about work sharing, um, most of which is about how to parallelize loops, which turns out to be what most people do with OpenMP most of the time. In week three, uh, we'll talk about synchronization, uh, and some other topics, including orphan directives and nested parallelism. Uh, and then in week four, um, I'll give a talk on which is essentially tips and tricks. This is kind of you know everything that you need to know and things that might go wrong that you that you should be aware of. Um, and I'll finish up talking about performance because um, it turns out that it's you know although it's not too difficult to write a correct OpenMP program. It's, uh, it's more difficult to write one that performs well. So understanding all the things that can go wrong with performance and thinking about ways to fix them uh, will, will come at the end of the course. OK, so our timetable is, so we'll, uh, run, a, we'll run from 2 PM to 4.30 uh, on each Wednesday afternoon. and so. Uh, each, I'll have a 30 minute break between the two talks every day. Okay, um, so all the notes for this course and the practical. this course uh, and find the materials that way. OK, so uh, the idea is that uh, in the weeks in, in between the lectures, you get a chance to uh, do some practical programming examples. And we are giving you access to our tier two cluster called Cirrus. Uh, so that you can do that. Uh, so you have a guest account for the duration of the course. Um, so we'll leave those active until the end of the year so that you have a chance to, uh, to do stuff even after the course is finished. So if you've, uh, if you've not already registered for an account, then please follow the instructions on the course web page as to how to do that. Uh, so the idea is that you get to work on the practical exercises in your own time. Uh, but if you're having problems, then please post on the course chat page. So that's also linked from the course web page. Uh, and uh, I or one of my colleagues will be monitoring this regularly and, um, and we'll, we'll answer, try and try our best to help you out and, and answer any questions you may have. Um, Please feel free to help each other out as well. So you know it's a communal chat page. So if you've uh, if you've if you've already solved a problem that somebody else have, please feel free to and help them out. So uh, full instructions for the exercises are in the exercise sheet, which is which you can download from from the course web. 
Okay, um, so just a bit of practical stuff. Uh, so once you've got your account on Cirrus, um, you can log in. So uh, Linux and Mac users can use this the SSH command from a terminal uh, to um, to log into Cirrus. Uh, what we recommend for Windows users is to install uh, an application called MobaX Term, uh, and there's some instructions on the on the course web page uh, as to where to, where to download that from uh, and how to use that to connect to. Okay, and once you're on the machine here the instructions for how to get hold of the source code okay so we provide some template code so you don't have to write everything from scratch essentially provide the sequential code for you to parallelize and um, so here's here's the set of commands that that you need to get hold of the uh, the uh, template code uh, and unpack the unpack the tar file so when you come to do that you can you can look up this is also in the uh, in, in the instruction, in the exercise sheet as well. Okay, good. So that's uh, that's the introduction. So what I'd like to do now is move on uh, to the first lecture, which is looking at shared memory programming with OpenMP and covering the, in the basic concept of shared memory. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by saying a little bit about the hardware that uh, that OpenMP is intended to work on, which is shared memory systems. Uh, and then I'm going to go through some of the basic concepts in threaded programming. So I won't really be talking much about OpenMP specifically right now. So these concepts are applicable to essentially any threaded programming API. So that would include you know, other APIs like POSIX threads or C++ threads, even stuff from other languages like Java threads as well. So these, these are the kind of the underlying concepts that, uh, that uh, OpenMP builds on top of, uh, but they, they apply to pretty much any threaded programming API. But it's helpful to have, have those uh, firmly in mind before we start looking at OpenMP's Specifically. Okay, so let's think about the hardware to begin with. So, uh, threaded programming is designed to be used on shared memory parallel computers. Okay, and it doesn't act doesn't in principle have to be. Uh, it's possible to implement this type of programming model on distributed memory systems, uh, but typically the performance is pretty disappointingly awful. Um, so we tend not to do that, particularly in uh, in high performance computing world where we're really, really care about the performance. Okay, so what do I mean by a shared memory parallel computer? So at the very basic level, so the, mod the mental model we should have is it's, uh, a number of processing units so uh, CPUs or cores uh, together with some memory. But the key feature of these shared memory systems is that they support a single address space across the whole memory system. So what does that mean? That means that every CPU or core is able to read and write all the memory locations in the system. So we really have one logical memory space uh, and all the CPUs or cores refer to a memory location use, using the same address. So the conceptual model is something like this. OK, it's uh, we have a bunch of processors, cores, CPUs at the top here in blue. Uh, and then we have a single global memory space in red at the bottom. And these are connected together somehow, and we don't particularly care about about the details of how that's done. So that's the 
that's the mental model that we that we have as a programmer real hardware is way more complicated in practice okay and um, so in particular uh, there can be um, multiple levels of cache memory present so in this example I've showed so every here every core has its own L1 level 1 cache uh, and a pair of processors shares a level 2 cache uh, and a pair of processors uh, here forms a, a chip or a socket uh, and we have multiple sockets in a machine each with each with their own memory so again so even this is a simplification so you know nowadays you know a socket may contain 16 24 32 cores uh, every core may have its have a private l1 and l2 cache there can be a, le a shared level 3 cache and then we might have well, at least two, poss possibly even four uh, chips or sockets in the same machine, each with their own memory. So there's a huge amount of potential complexity in, in modern hardware. Um, but despite all this, then it still supports this simple model to the programmer of just having processors and a global shared memory. Uh, so the hardware takes care of the fact that, that all these caches are present and there are actually physically different memory modules. But nevertheless, we have this support for a single address space where every processor is able to read and write all the memory locations in the system. So I want to move on now and talk a bit about the programming model. So the programming model for shared memory is, is based on the notion of threads. OK, no big surprise. So threads are like processes, uh, except that threads can share memory with each other, as well as having their own private memory. So uh, at least by default, separate processes have entire separate memory spaces. And can only access its own memory. Uh, when we have threads, however, then we also have the possibility of having uh, shared memory. So memory where uh, every thread can access some shared data. So we have these two types of data present. So, you, so we have uh, some shared data, which can be accessed by all the threads that are running. And we have some private data which can only be accessed by the owning thread. So in order to do useful things in parallel, different threads can follow different flows of control through the same program. Um, so in other words, another way of thinking about this is that every thread has its own program counter. So every thread has its own notion of which, which instruction to execute next. And in terms of how this maps onto the hardware, well, normally for performance reasons, we usually think about a one-to-one -one mapping between threads and CPU cores. Uh, there's nothing to stop us running more. Okay? So the operating system will perfectly happily allow you to run many, many more threads than you have cores on your machine. Uh, and it will attempt to timeshare between the threads and give every thread uh, fair access to some to some time slices of of the of the course. Modern hardware also has hardware support for multiple threads per core. So this is a hardware feature which is. Uh, called simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, you might also have heard it called hyper-threading, which is actually Intel's proprietary term for, for this feature. Um, but that's also quite common terminology. 
Okay. So here I've just got a visual representation of this. Thread and a, a red thread. And each thread has its own program counter and its own private data, but all three threads have access to the same shared data. So let's think a bit now about how threads communicate with each other. So in, also, in order to have useful parallel programs, threads must be able to exchange data with each other somehow. Okay? Uh, and the way this happens is that simply threads communicate with each other via reading and writing shared data. So if we want to uh, get a value from thread one to thread two, then the way to do that is that thread one will write a value to some shared variable in its shared data space. Let's call it A. And then at some point later, thread two is able to read the value from that same variable in the shared data space. Um, so really the point here is that there is no notion or concept of messages in this model. So in that respect, it's, uh, it's completely different to uh, distributed memory models, uh, message passing, or MPI, if you've ever programmed in, in, in MPI. Um, threads don't send messages to each other. They just communicate by reading and writing to their shared data space. OK, so I just want to illustrate a little bit more how that works. So here. On, on this slide, I have uh, two threads, thread one and thread two. And you can see that I'm going to show a, prog a, pro a, bit, of, a bit of program, so the statements that they execute. Uh, and then you'll see that each thread, has, again, has its own private data. Uh, and then there's some shared data down at the bottom. So how might thread one communicate something to thread two? Well, thread one might say assign a value 23 to a variable called my a, which happens to live in its private data space. Um, don't worry just now about how we know it's in the private data space. Um, we will come to that later on with, with, uh, when we start talking about OpenMP specifically. So there we are. So we have the value 23 stored in a memory location in thread one's private data space. And then it might, for example, then copy that value into a variable called A, which happens to live in the shared data space. So now we have also the value of 23 stored in, in, shared, in the shared data. And then sometime later, thread two might access that shared variable A and then do some computation with it. So in this case, it's doing is it's going to it's going to read A, add one to it, and store that in its private data space. So you can see here quite clearly now that. The variables called my a because they live in the private data space of each thread. Every th every thread has its own copy of that data, and the values of those variables may be different as they are in this case. Okay, so the value of my a is 23 in thread one, and it's 24 in thread two. For shared variables that live in the shared data space. There only, there only ever is one copy of those, 
uh, and both threads see the same value in there. There is one copy of A that lives in the shared data space uh, and it currently has the value 23. What I kind of glossed over in that last little example is how does thread two know that it, that, it, that it must wait for thread one to write the value to A before it reads it? Yeah. Uh, so that brings us on to the concept of synchronization because by default, threads execute asynchronously. So uh, every thread just carries on executing its own sequence of instructions, just proceeds through the program instructions completely independently of what other threads are doing. Okay? So um, most of the time, th nothing about what other threads are doing. So that means as programmers, we need to do something to ensure those actions on shared variables really do occur in the correct order. So in the previous example, you know, we have to make sure somehow that thread one has actually written that variable A before thread two reads it. Okay. And sometimes because we tend to reuse memory locations, we may want the dependency the other way around. So you know, we might, for example, want to make sure that, uh, that thread one reads the old value in, in, in A before thread, thread two writes something new into it. The other really important thing to, to note here is that uh, if a thread makes an update to a shared variable, so for example, it's, you know, it, it has executes a piece of, piece of code like A equals A plus one, where A is a variable, then those updates are not atomic. So what does that mean? Um, well, I'll illustrate that on the next slide, but essentially what happens is if two threads both try to do that at the same time, one of those updates may get overwritten. Um, this is an example of what, we, what in threaded programming we call a race condition. Okay? So if two threads try to act a shared variable without any synchronization, and at least one of those access accesses is a right access, then we have a problem. Because, because if we don't synchronize the threads, we don't know in what order those actions are going to happen. They may be different on different runs of the program. So we end up with a particularly unpleasant sort of bug. It's non-deterministic behavior. So you may have a program where sometimes you run it and you get the right result. Other times when you run it, you get the wrong result. That's completely different from how bugs in sequential programs typically work. Okay? If you have a bug in a sequential program, then typically you will always see the bug in Threaded programs, we have a completely different type of non-deterministic behavior possible. And we need to really defend against that because it makes testing programs very difficult. Because you can't guarantee that, that failures will always occur. Okay, on the next slide, I'm going to show you why this kind of update to a shared variable, uh, what happens, okay? And down at the hardware level, what's going on? That, that means that the update is not atomic and that values can get lost and you can get the wrong answer. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show uh, two threads which are both going to try to add one to a shared variable. 
So the thing to realize here is that although that's a single statement in your source code, by the time that's been compiled down to assembly code, there's at least three different operations going on here. So first of all, A has to be loaded from main memory, uh, and it will be typically stored in, in a register uh, in the CPU. Then the addition happens, uh, and the result of the addition is also stored in a register. Uh, and then finally, the new value will be stored back into main memory. So although this looks like a single, and it is a single line of source code, there, are, there will be at least three assembly instructions going on there. Okay. So now let's think about what, what can happen here. Okay. So although this looks very like the previous diagram, I'm now thinking really about what's going on in the hardware here. So I'm going to show for every thread the sequence of instructions, the load, the add, and the store. Uh, and then we're going to show what gets stored in the CPU registers uh, and what gets stored in memory. Okay. So suppose we start off and we have uh, a value 10 stored in the variable in main memory. Okay. And we're going to try to get both threads to add one to it. So, Okay, remember that keeping asynchronously. So this is one possible, one of many possible orders in which these instructions may happen in time. So first thing that happens is thread one will load A into its CPU registers. Now thread two also loads A into its register. Then thread one does the addition. So it has the value 11 in the register. Thread two also does the addition. It also has the value 11. Okay. And now you can possibly start to see what's going to go wrong here. Thread one does the store memory. So the value in memory is now 11. And finally, thread two stores its value back into memory. Okay. Oh dear. So what happened? So we started off with the value 10. Both threads tried to add one to it. But instead of ending up with the result of 12, which is what we would have liked, we ended up with the value of 11. Okay. So this is an example of a, a race condition because some different orderings of those instructions. So, you know, for example, as long as thread one executes its load, add, and store instruction before thread two executes its load instruction, then everything would have been okay. So when we have updates like this, we have to synchronize the threads to make sure that only one thread at a time is allowed to try to modify shared variables. Otherwise, we would have this nasty, um, very difficult to debug non-deterministic behavior going on. Okay. So the next concept I want to introduce you is to the notion of tasks. So a task is just a piece of computation which can be executed independently of other tasks. So essentially, this is what we're trying to do when we want to write parallel programs, is to try and identify tasks is to try and split our computation up into pieces which can be executed independently of each other. Now, in principle, what we could do is to create a new thread to execute every task. 
Um, but in practice, that can, this can be too expensive because actually creating threads, asking the operating system to create a new thread for you is relatively an expensive operation. So if we have large numbers of small tasks, then doing stuff that way isn't going to work very well. So what we can do instead is we can es essentially uh, get tasks to be executed by a pre-existing pool of threads. So what we will do is that at the beginning of the program, we will create some threads. And again, because of this, uh, the, the cost of, 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 running, of creating and running threads and swapping threads between, between cores, what we will normally do is create a number of threads that is matched to the hardware resources. And so that might be you know, one thread per core or one thread per hyper thread. So once we have some existing threads, tasks are submitted to the pool and some thread in the pool will execute that task and some point in the future we will have some guarantee that that task will be completed so this is a way of essentially decoupling the decomposition of our computation uh, from the actual threads which are executing it Tasks may, in fact, be ordered with respect to other tasks. So there may be depend dependencies between them. So we may be able to specify that, say, uh, task one must be executed before task two because task one is producing a result that task two is going to consume. The next idea I want to talk about is parallel loops. Uh, and this is because, especially in scientific computing, we find that loops are the main source of parallelism in, in many applications. And they're not the only potential source of parallelism, but they're by far the most common one. And the concept here is really very simple, because if the iterations of a loop are independent, so in other words, they can be done in any order without affecting the result of the program. Then what we can do is share out the iterations of the loop between th different threads. So if we, for example, if we have uh, a loop like this, okay, which is just uh, adding together the elements of two vectors, then that doesn't matter what order we do them in. Okay, so we could do, we could go forwards, we can start at zero uh, and end at 99, or we could start at 99 and go back to zero, or we could do all the, all the odd ones first and then all the even ones. So it doesn't matter what order we do those loop iterations in, so the, the loop's always going to produce the same result. So if that's the case, what we can do is we can share those iterations out between threads. Um, so for example, here we might say, okay, uh, let's do something totally simple. We'll do the first 50 iterations on one thread and the second 50 iterations on, on the other thread. In practice, actually this example really won't work. A hundred hundred um, additions like that is is way too small to, to be worth parallelizing. Um, but you get the idea. So one way of looking at, at that is that we can think of a loop iteration or maybe a set of loop iterations as a task. They form an independent chunk of computation which we can assign to a thread. And the last concept I'm going to introduce you to now is reductions. So 
Uh, a reduction is, is a computation that produces a single value from um, mathematically associative operations like addition, multiplication, uh, maximum, minimum, logical and, logical or. Uh, by far the most common use case is addition. So, you know, we very often have um, codes like this. So where we want to say form the sum of the elements in a vector. So this code just um, assigns an initial value to, to B, which is zero, and it loops over the elements of A uh, and forms the sum of those values. So think about what's going to happen if we try to show those loop iterations out between different threads. Okay, so we'd like to do this computation in parallel. If we simply do this and have B as a shared variable, then we have a problem because we have precisely the type of unsynchronized update to a shared variable from multiple threads, which uh, I walked you th through before. So if we simply try to, to let threads loose uh, and do unsynchronized updates to B, then we will have a non-deterministic program, which will sometimes produce the wrong answer. However, if we try to fix that by allowing only one thread at a time to update B, then we'll get the right answer, but we'll have removed all the parallelism. So, uh, and in fact, the overheads of doing the synchronization will mean that it, it will run actually slower on multiple threads than, than the original code ran on a single thread. So that's also no good. So the solution here is, is pretty, again, it's a pretty obvious thing to do. What, we'll, what, what we can get is each thread to accumulate its, uh, a partial sum in its own private copy of B. Uh, and then these copies are reduced together, so for addition, added together at the end to produce the final result. In which case, provided the number of operations is much larger than the number of threads, so, you know, what I want you to have, have in mind here is say, you know, n equals a million uh, and we have 16 threads. So the number of additions is you know, several orders of magnitude bigger than the number of threads. Then almost all those additions can be executed in parallel with threads accumulating into their own private copy of B. Uh, and then we have a small number of synchronized additions to do at the end to take those partial sums uh, and form the final result that we need. Okay, so uh, let me come out of my presentation now and, uh, uh, and, and, and take any questions that might be on that one. Okay, so if there's uh, no questions just for now, then um, that's the end of the first lecture for today. So um, I will recommence at 3.30 as, as promised. Okay, welcome back everybody. So uh, in this second session, I'm going to talk about the fundamental concepts in, in OpenMP. So I'm gonna go over the basic concepts that, that underpin OpenMP. Uh, then I'll say a little bit about the history uh, of where OpenMP came from. Uh, and then cover some of the practical aspects of compiling and running OpenMP programs to allow you to get started on the uh, practical exercises. <laughs>
So to begin with, what is OpenMP? So OpenMP is an API which is designed for programming shared memory parallel computers. So it uses the concepts of threads and tasks, which I introduced in the, in the lecture earlier on. And OpenMP is a set of extensions to Fortran, C, and C++. And these extensions consist of three different things. So most of the uh, const most of OpenMP is consists of compiler directives, and I'll say in a moment exactly what that means. There are also runtime library routines, and there are some environment variables which are also part of the specification. So what's a directive? A directive is a special line of source code with meaning only to certain compilers. And a directive is distinguished by what's called a sentinel at the start of a line. So the sentinel is just a sequence of characters which indicates that this is an OpenMP directive and it's not a statement or anything else in the underlying base language. So OpenMP sentinels are for Fortran, exclamation mark dollar OMP, and for C and C++, hash pragma OMP. So you might wonder why that choice of sentinels. Well, what that means is that OpenMP directives are ignored if the code is just compiled as regular sequential Fortran or C or C++. Because uh, for Fortran, any line with an exclamation mark is treated as a comment. And for C and C++, uh, a hash pragma pre statement is ignored if the compiler doesn't know what it is. So it will just simply it, it, it treat it as a, uh, as a blank line. What's the point of this? Well, it's, uh, it's intended to help in the software engineering process because it helps us as programmers write a single base of source code which can function correctly as both an OpenMP parallel program and a plain old Fortran C or C++ sequential program as well. And that's quite useful because it stops us having to maintain separate versions of the code for sequential or parallel execution. Uh, and that, that can be very useful. And then this feature on its own does not guarantee that, that property, but it helps. Uh, so I obviously also have calls to the runtime library. Then we also need to, to, to take care of that as well. Um, and it's also possible to write OpenMP programs that if you try to compile them without OpenMP simply will not execute correctly. Um, so it's, not, it's no guarantee, but it's a feature which, which, which supports this idea that you can write programs that function both as sequential programs and as OpenMP parallel programs. So let's now look at parallel region. So the parallel region is the basic parallel construct in OpenMP. So a parallel region defines a section of a program. And what happens is when, a, when an OpenMP program starts executing, it begins execution on a single thread, which we call the master thread. So it behaves just like a normal sequential executable until it gets to the point where the first parallel region is encountered in the code. At that point, at least logically, what happens is the master thread then creates what we call a team of threads. So the master thread creates 
some additional threads, and then every thread, including the master, will execute the statements which are inside the parallel region. So this is what's called a fork join model of parallelism. If you've heard of that before, that's great. Um, that's what OpenMP is. If you've not heard of that before, don't worry. Um, it's just a, a piece of terminology that, uh, that indicates that this style of parallelism where we start executing on a single thread, we then create a, a team of threads, and then we go back to sequential execution again. So that's the model that OpenMP uses. So every thread executes the statements which are inside the parallel region. And then when we get to the end of the parallel region, the master thread waits for the other threads to finish that piece of code. And then it continues on its own back in sequential mode again, executing the next statements in the program. And we can repeat this process as many times as we like within the lifetime of an OpenMP program. So we may be constantly swapping back and forth between sequential execution on the master thread and parallel execution inside parallel regions. So this slide is meant to illustrate this process. So on the left-hand side here, we essentially have time running from top to bottom. Uh, and on the right hand side, okay, I'm giving you some sneak preview of some syntax. So we have the structure of, of an OpenMP program in Fortran on the left uh, and in C on the right. So when the program starts executing, it starts off on the master thread, uh, executing on its own, just like a sequential executable. And that's what we call the sequential part of the program. So when we get to the first parallel region, so in Fortran, that's the piece of code between the parallel and end parallel directives. In C, it's the block of code in curly braces that follows the parallel directive. So at that point, the master thread creates a team of threads. So I've shown a total of eight threads here on the left-hand side. So that consists of the master, which executes the parallel region together with an additional seven threads to make a total of eight. So all eight threads execute that block of code that's inside the parallel region. At the end of the parallel region, the master thread then waits for all the other threads to also finish executing that block of code. So there's a synchronization point at the end of the parallel region. The master thread waits for all the other threads to reach that point. Once they've all got there, then the master thread carries on executing on its own again. So we're now outside the parallel region we're back in the sequential part of the program. The master thread is executing on its own. And then when we get to the next parallel region, that process repeats itself over again. So we create another team of threads. They execute the contents of the next parallel region. The master thread waits for them to finish and then back to sequential execution again. So it's possible to have as many parallel regions as we want inside an OpenMP program. So an OpenMP program might execute a million parallel regions during its lifetime. So I talked in the first lecture about shared and private data. So how does that work in, in OpenMP? Well, when we're inside a parallel region, the variables that are accessed can either be shared or private. And that works kind of how you expect. So all threads see the same copy of shared variables. 
Okay? So there's what for a shared variable, there's one copy and all threads see that copy. And all threads are able to read or write those shared variables. Each thread has its own copy of private variables and these are invisible to other threads. So a private variable can only be read or written by its own thread. Now this is the point where particularly C or C++ programmers start having thoughts to themselves and they say, okay, so what happens if I have a private variable and I take its address and store that in a shared variable, then another thread can read that address and dereference it and access another thread's private variable. That isn't allowed. Okay. So uh, that almost certainly won't be caught by the compiler. And okay. that's a very difficult kind of uh, thing, thing to be caught at compile time. Uh, it probably won't be it probably won't be caught at run as a runtime er error either. Um, but the OpenMP specification is very clear that you're not allowed to do that. Uh, it's a crazy thing to do from a software engineering point of view. <laughs> it's a way to write to write completely obscure and difficult to understand programs. So if you did have that thought, then please put that away now. So private variables can only be accessed by their owning thread. In the first lecture, I stressed the importance of synchronization. So in order to make sure that threads do access shared variables in the right order and that we avoid this problem of having race conditions where threads have unordered accesses to shared variables and one of those accesses or more than one of those accesses is the right access in which case we might have undetermined, undetermined or non-deterministic behavior. So the main synchronization concepts that OpenMP uses are, are these. Okay? The first of them is a barrier. Uh, and this is a full synchronization point between all the threads in the program. So all threads must arrive at a barrier before any thread can proceed past it. Okay? And we typically use this for delimit delimiting different phases of the computation. So what we do is every thread does some computation where it accessing uh, every thread is accessing different shared variables. We can then have a barrier synchronization point. So we know that all threads have reached the same point in the program. Uh, and then beyond that, then it's safe for them to access uh, variables which were written by other threads before the barrier. Second type of synchronization that, that OpenMP supports is critical region. So this is a section of code which only one thread at a time can enter. Uh, and that's exactly what we need to avoid the update problem, which I talked about earlier. So this can be used if we really do want threads to modify shared variables. We put that modification inside a critical region. That makes sure that only one thread at a time can update a shared variable. Uh, and that means that the problem of unsynchronized concurrent updates is avoided. A related concept, which is actually a subset, of, is kind of like a subset of a critical region, is an atomic update. So this is an update to a variable which can be performed by only one thread at a time. So it's the same idea here. So we're preventing multiple threads from updating uh, shared variables at the same time. It's a special.
Why is it different from a critical region? A critical region can contain any arbitrary code, whereas a, an, an atomic update is just a single update to a particular memory location. And in week three, we will take a, uh, an in-depth in look at this type of synchronization and how critical regions and atomic updates are different. Okay, so those are the main concepts that OpenMP is built on top of. So I wanted to give you a brief bit of historical background here. OpenMP is now really quite old. Okay? It's more than 20 years old. Um, why did it come into existence? Well, prior to existence of OpenMP, this style of programming existed for quite some time. And uh, there were a number of different hardware vendors who made and sold shared memory parallel computers. And typically what happened was that every hardware vendor provided a different API. Um, these were mainly directive based. So in that sense, like OpenMP, uh, they were almost all for Fortran. Uh, so there wasn't this type of support for C programs at the time. So if you wanted to do shared memory parallelism with C or C++, then typically you had to use a library like POSIX threads. So what this meant that it was hard to write portable code. You had to introduce a different set of directives for every machine and for every compiler you wanted to run your code on, um, which was awkward and Although a lot of the directives were kind of similar between different APIs, there were some differences. Uh, so the whole, the whole process was a bit messy. So the OpenMP forum was set up by a bunch of companies. And so it really was led by industry. And so some of these companies still exist and some of them don't. Okay, so uh, there was digital, which became Compaq, uh, which eventually became HP. There's IBM, which still exists. Intel, which still exists. Uh, KA is a small compiler company, which was bought by Intel and most of and became Intel's compiler team. And SGI, who became for a while and then went back to SGI and are now rackable systems, I think. So from that initial group of companies, uh, the OpenMP Forum, which is whose proper name is the, uh, the ARB or Architecture Review Board, now includes almost 30 different organizations. So it includes most major vendors, uh, it includes some academic organizations, so including ourselves at CC, um, some other European universities, and some organizations in, in the US, including some of the large government labs like Lawrence Livermore uh, and Sandia. The one exception, um, which perhaps isn't too surprising, is uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft did belong to the OpenMP ARB for a while. They did develop an OpenMP compiler uh, in Visual Studio. Unfortunately, they then decided to leave the org OpenMP organization, uh, which means that the Visual Studio compilers uh, they support a relatively old version of OpenMP, and they have no intention of upgrading them. So that's a bit sad. So originally, the, the first standard came out was the OpenMP Fortran standard in 1997, and that went through some, some revisions. And the C, C++ standard followed a year later uh, and also went, went through some revisions up to 
uh, at which point uh, those of us who were working on the on the specifications um, came to the realization that having two completely separate specifications was not really a good thing because they said the same thing in different ways between Fortran and C and C++. And in some places, they actually contradicted each other. So that was not a very good situation to be in. So what happened then was uh, version 2.5 was essentially just a merge of the two different standards into a single document, which uh, if you look at the standard, there are it's uh, there's a lot of common text uh, and then it has blocks of text which are specific to, to one or other of the base languages. So after that came version three, which introduced some new features, including tasks, which I'm not going to talk about in, in this series of lectures. Um, some better support for loop parallelism, nested parallelism, which I will talk about later on. Um, it's been through some more different versions. Um, and so in particular, uh, version four introduced the ability to do accelerator offloading. So this is a way of using uh, OpenMP directives to offload computations onto accelerated devices. So that's primarily onto GPUs. Um, so uh, it is possible to use OpenMP to, to program GPUs. Uh, again, I'm not going to cover that material in, in, in this secret series of lectures. So typically what you'll find in most compilers these days is either version 4 or 4.5. Most of them are 4.5, um, but the support for accelerator offloading is, is quite patchy. Okay, So if we discount the, the accelerator stuff, most compilers are 4.5 compliant. Version 5 is up real soon. <laughs> scarily enough. So the plan is to release version five next month. Um, but as usual, we'll have to wait probably 18 months to two years to see those, uh, to see the, the, the version five uh, becoming available in, in the compilers. So there's usually this lag of about a, uh, a year and a half to two years while uh, the compiler teams implement the latest specification. So the message is essentially, if you want to um, look at the specification, then probably reading 4.0 or 4.5 is the right one to read at the moment. Uh, and the way to get hold of that is to go to the OpenMP website. So www.openmp.org is the official website for OpenMP. Uh, and probably the most useful thing you can find there is the, the language specification documents. Um, the early versions used to be quite easy to read. Um, the most recent versions are getting bigger and more complicated and more having less clear, well, has very precise terminology, but getting your head around what everything means and the way uh, the specification uses certain terms is actually quite difficult these days. Um, so just a word of warning, if you go start going diving into the, into the uh, OpenMP specification, it can take you quite a while of trawling through the glossary to figure out what they're actually talking about. So also on the official website, you will find uh, links to compilers, Okay, so you'll find that you can, there's, a, there's a list of available compilers that support OpenMP. So these, it's most of the common compilers that you're likely to come across, at least in the high performance computing world. Um, pretty much every compiler has, has inbuilt support for OpenMP. So I mentioned the exception of, uh, of Microsoft. So Microsoft has never developed the 
um, their compilers beyond version 2.0. So there is some stuff in there, but things like tasks and a bunch of other more recent features are missing from, from Microsoft's compilers. Uh, if you're working in a different world, if you're working with embedded processes and uh, in that in that kind of in that kind of space, then the compiler support is is, is a is is a good deal more patchy. But for uh, for so sort of HPC type applications, um, the sort of processes and chips that we work with, typically the compilers all have OpenMP built into them. Okay. Um, if you're a fan of textbooks, uh, the good news is yes, there is a well. There are two textbooks which which cover open pretty much most of OpenMP. Um, so the way this works is there's, there's the original book, which is the first one here, using OpenMP, Portable Shared Memory Parallel Programming, uh, covers up to features up to version 2.5, uh, and then the second book. Uh, covers more recent features, so it covers uh, features that are added from from 3.0 onwards. Okay, so most of, in fact, pretty much everything that I'm talking about uh, in this sequence of lectures is uh, covered by the first book. If you're if you're interested in in getting hold of a textbook. So that brings us on to the practical stuff of how to compile and run OpenMP programs. So as I, as I just indicated, OpenMP is built into most of the compilers that you're likely to use. So to compile an OpenMP program, it's just a question of adding a compiler-specific flag to your compile and link commands. Okay? So this is different for different compilers. So for example, it's uh, minus F OpenMP for GNU compilers, um, it's minus Q OpenMP uh, for Intel compilers, and for and some, some compilers it's on by default. So for Craze compilers, for example, uh, which are available on, on Archer if you're, if you're an Archer user, then uh, OpenMP is actually switched on by default and, you, and, and there is a flag to turn it off. The next thing you need to know is how to run OpenMP programs. Um, but before we run an OpenMP program, what we have to do is to decide how many threads we want the program to use. Uh, and there are several ways of doing this, but by far the most common and convenient way is to do this uh, at runtime, at compile time. Uh, and this is done by setting an environment variable called OMP underscore num underscore threads. So the name of that environment variable is defined by the specification. So that is the same across all compilers. So the compiler flag to get, it, to get the compiler to recognize the OpenMP directives is not standardized. The environment variable to tell the runtime, uh, how many threads you want to actually use, that is a standard thing. So what we do is we set that before we run the program. So for example, in, if we're in bash shell, we might issue the command export OMP num threads equals four. And then we can just run in the same way you would run a sequential program. So just by typing the name of the executor. So in this respect, OpenMP is different from uh, APIs like MPI, where you need a special launcher program to start an MPI program running. For OpenMP programs, you just run them the same way as you would run the sequential program. Okay, um, so that's enough information for you to get started on the practical exercises. So I uh, haven't really 
told you very much about how to write parallel programs in OpenMP yet. That'll come next week. Um, so between now and then, what it would be, uh, what you might like to do is just make sure that you can, uh, you're able to on to Cirrus, get hold of the template source code, and uh, just figure out how to compile and run a, a trivial Hello World program. So what you can do is you know, compile it and run it. And then you can experiment and say, you use the environment OMP num threads environment variable to change the number of threads. And when you do that, run the code several, for several times and, and observe, is the output always the same? Uh, and if not, can you figure out what's going on there? Okay, that's great. So that's the end of this lecture. Um, if you have any questions, then please feel free to type in the chat box and collaborate, and, uh, and I'll try and answer them. So otherwise, good luck with the practical exercises. If you have any problems, um, please post in on the on the chat page. I'll I'll be looking at that and uh, and trying to answer all your questions.